was pretty fashionable in high school. <laughs> this was in the late 80s, early 90s. My style was kind of a blend of Euro fashions gleaned from Vogue, retro cool, and a dose of the limited thrown in for good measure. <laughs> I had also had it drilled into my brain from a very young age by my mother that I was a representation of her. If I dressed weird or sloppy, I was sending a message that my mother must be crazy or poor. <laughs> and that message would travel back with all the school children to their dinner tables. And all the townspeople would then obviously discuss how crazy and or poor she was. <laughs> and she would be damned if she sent that message to the other kids' mothers. <laughs> so, since I had a mom who wanted me to dress well, and I had pretty good taste, I had forged a solid submissive habit of dressing up for school. But then I moved out, and I started attending a liberal arts college in Charleston, South Carolina. College of Charleston, where a main building's Greek inscription on the facade translates to know thyself. It was exactly the kind of college you would find in 90s movies, where everybody wore <laughs> where everybody wore flannel shirts or pajama bottoms to classes. We even had that one kid who was always going to classes in roller skates. <laughs> and immediately, I didn't fit in. I looked like I had just walked in from having my high school yearbook photo taken. <laughs> my first day of classes, my English lit professor referenced Nirvana and Soundgarden. My classmates smelled like Pantene, Hirachi sandals, and marijuana. I grew envious of their lifestyle. Nobody seemed to give a shit about anything. But they were still so happy. What was the secret? I don't know if it was liberation from my mom's tyrannical dress code or an actual attraction to the look, but I found myself adopting the fashions of my classmates. It started with rolling out of bed late. I'd go to class with wet, pantene-washed hair. Everybody else is using it. It must be good. And then, well, shit, if I'm going to go to class with wet hair, I might as well relax a little bit. It's fine to put on a t-shirt, which turned into, hmm, I don't have many t-shirts with me here. I like these that everybody else has, the ones with the weird-looking teddy bears all over them. What is that? <laughs> And before you could say truckin', there I was. <laughs> Two months in, and I had turned into my parents' worst liberal arts college nightmare. <laughs> you never would have recognized that girl who just last spring had used a curling iron every day, who had worn silk shirts and brocade skirts to school who now wore tie-dyed shirts and baggy jeans daily, whose feet had now conformed to her first pair of Birkenstocks, <laughs> and who bought Led Zeppelin albums. Well, greatest hits, anyway. My transformation affected my taste in men, too. I was no longer drawn to the cute, nerdy, clean-cut boys that I liked in high school the ones who went on to college and likely succeeded in their first semester, instead of getting mostly Ds, as I did. The rebellious or lazy side of me took over and honed my hormones in on guys like Steve, who I did meet at a college sports event, but he was the guy selling slices of pizza in the bleachers. I liked guys with wavy ponytails and dirty hands, guys who could play acoustic guitar, Guys who could afford dime bags, but not dinner. <laughs> I eventually got involved with a guy named Luke. <laughs> Luke also came from a family who liked for him to present himself nicely. He had gone to a prestigious prep school in Virginia, and when he came to Charleston to college, he had the freedom to fully indulge his interest. Here, he was able to practice religion without persecution, and he became a Rasta. 
he was able to finally follow his heart like every white prep school kid should be able to do. He had an enormous Rastafari Lion of Judah tattoo on his pelvis. And his daily devotional, of course, was smoking a shit ton of weed. Late at night, we scaled walls into the Charleston elite's private gardens. We would lie on our backs in their grass and stare up at the stars. Sometimes the smell of Luke's pot would waft into their homes and alert them to our presence, and we'd have to clamber over the walls back to safety, never fully realizing the extent of trouble we could find ourselves in, but giggling, running for blocks, with me tripping over my jeans. Luke had a part-time job of being a rickshaw driver, pretty much carting <laughs> drunk people around town. This was back when it wasn't as easy to track a person, so Luke would forget to call some pickups into his operator, or he would give somebody a discounted ride on his way back to the company at the end of the night and pocket the cash. He'd go to the corner convenience store and buy pretzels and malt liquor to have with his nightly prayer service. Sometimes I would hang out with him on these late night snack runs. Sometimes my friend Sheila would come along too. One night after a Grateful Dead tribute band's show had run, late, had run late, Luke picked us up at the venue and took us for a joy ride. While Luke was inside the convenience store, Sheila thought it might be funny to try rickshaw driving. As I stood in the sidelines of the parking lot, laughing, Sheila managed the kind of half pedal you might see an 18-month-old perform on a trike, her feet slipping off the pedals. She had barely made a circle when Luke returned. He shrieked and dropped his brown-bagged 40, the bottle shattering on the macadam. He scolded us for our irresponsibility <laughs> and let us know how he could lose his job over something so careless as that. I was just a bystander. It didn't matter. After a couple days, Luke got over the parking lot incident. We resumed hanging out, making out, listening to Marley, Zeppelin, and Fish. I went back to skipping some morning classes so I could hang out with him, Sheila, and Luke's fuzzy-headed roommate in their dingy, smoke-filled dorm room. Unlike the 90s movie cliché, somehow there never was a meddling, asshole RA around to monitor things. <laughs> they had beanbags and bongs. They had Nirvana, MC Escher, and Grateful Dead posters up a Jamaican flag and starry night. <laughs> Those guys couldn't figure out who they wanted to be. None of us could. They didn't know their choices any more than I knew if I wanted my silk shirts or my tie-dyed ones. One day Luke pulled me aside into his bedroom. It was a little awkward with bunk beds, but we climbed up. And as he unbuttoned my long bell-bottom jeans, he said, Look, I got something to tell you. My hand stopped his from continuing. <laughs> A minute later, I emerged from the bedroom and told Sheila we had to leave. In that way that all pissed-off girls at a party trying to drag their friends away do. And in the way that all friends who are still having a good time protest, Sheila protested. Sheila didn't know that Luke's ex-girlfriend was having a problem with some stalker and needed Luke to come help her, protect her, whatever. Sheila didn't know that Luke wanted a role in the top bunk with me for romance's sake before he left for Virginia, for good. He wouldn't be coming back next semester. And since Sheila wanted to stay, and since as much as I hated Luke at that moment, I still wanted to soak it all in for another few minutes. And since I was missing my geology final anyway, I figured, why not? <laughs> and I sat there. I could feel it coming to an end. Me, Luke, the semester, my ridiculous fucking genes that tripped me up all the time. <laughs> this. So I sat there while we turned on the CD player and sang, steer it up. <laughs> I sat there and noticed bright sunlight trying to peek in around the blackout drapes they'd installed. I looked at Luke's dumb khaki cutoff shorts, the ones he'd made from slicing up preppy chino pants. 
and I thought about his Lion of Judah tattoo and how he told me he wanted to live in the projects one day so he could know what it feels like to be a regular person. I grasped Sheila's hand. She stood up to leave. When she did, she accidentally kicked over the massive bong that was the treasure of room 141 of Davidson Hall. Dark green glass shards sprayed, bong shrapnel scattered and clinked all over the floor. Oh fuck, the bong water went everywhere, Luke said. <laughs> to me, everywhere meant my shirt, jeans, skin, and shoes. But apparently it got on their floor too. And it was old bong water. <laughs> Had been collecting and festering for days. I stood, dripping with this pot diarrhea all over me. <laughs> Luke was frantically tending to the floor, mopping up with a t-shirt, worrying about the smell and the RA sensing trouble if he ever showed up. His roommate was lamenting the loss of the oversized bong. Sheila, apologizing to everyone, didn't know whether we should stay and help or get the hell out, and was looking to me for answers. I stared at the broken glass on the floor, the brown liquid bleeding into the carpet. I had been just a bystander. I took Sheila's hand and led her out of the room. We didn't say a word as we left the building, only a hug and a wave goodbye. When I got back to my dorm, I showered, scrubbed, lounged around in my robe for a few minutes as I looked through my CDs. I put on a mixtape, still had plenty of those that I brought with me from high school, and dug through my closet for something nice to put on. After all, I had a geology professor to track down and beg for a second chance. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Corley.